Thank you very much. It's nice to be here in Herzliya. Uh, I've been here a couple times before. Every time it's wonderful. The good, good weather and the wonderful food. And um, I've got the pleasure of working for Hewlett Packard 20 years ago. And uh, today I, I work with the Internet Infrastructure Group uh, using both vector network analyzers and time domain reflectometers to look at signal integrity problems. And so what I'm going to talk about today is the time and frequency domain simulation to measurement techniques for characterizing USB type C reference channel. This is from an excerpt of a tutorial that I did with my co-authors, Heidi Barnes and Jeff Most. And so while we talk specifically about this design case study for USB type C, you can really apply this to most high-speed digital interconnect, right? And interconnect we define as a linear passive device. So backplanes, PCBs, cables, connectors. These are all linear passive interconnect. So what we're going to talk about is why should we think about de-embedding or removing fixtures? Uh, what is a plug-and-play fixture? We have a design case study for the USB Type-C, and we're going to compare various air correction techniques for measurements in the lab. Uh, and I would like to take you through a step-by-step -step time domain analysis. I'm a, a digital engineer by education, and when I was at the university, uh, I took one course in field and wave theory, and I said, forget it, I'm going digital. Well. Unfortunately, the high-speed digital on PCBs have become so fast that all of the PCB traces have become microwave transmission lines. So I've had to learn vector network analysis and S-parameters, and this is true for most high-speed digital engineers today. So one of the main challenges that we're going to talk about is building the channel model uh, of course, we can use some very sophisticated modeling techniques. Um, I've been focusing on the measurements in the lab, and many designers that we, we um, sell our test equipment to, they have the, the job of cascading all the models from many different vendors uh, into one channel. And this is the challenge, and it's, it's actually quite a big deal. Uh, the end user must mix and match in order to get the optimum combination of the interconnect and the cables and, and the whole channel. So this is the price performance challenge that we must rise to. So one of the difficult problems in, in trying to build this channel model is measuring a, a specific structure that's in the middle of a lot of other things that you don't care about. For example, uh, vias are a very critical part of a channel that we wish we didn't have to have, but we have to live with them. And in this case, the via is in the middle of, of a PCB material, probably FR4 with very high loss, and then SMA connectors on either side where there's a coaxial to planar transition that may give big reflections. And all of these difficulties for the high-speed signal propagating through it cause us headaches. And so how do we just focus in on getting that one small structure that we're, we want to characterize? Well, we have a number of ways to do it. And one of the ways that's common is called de-embedding, right? So we have a general umbrella term called air correction. And air correction can be pre-measurement air correction or post-measurement air correction. Traditionally, the pre-measurement air correction we call calibration. So most likely, if you've ever calibrated a, a vector network analyzer, you've done SOLT. How many people have done SOLT calibration? Yes. So this is short, open load through. And you can see here with the calibration kit that's standardized and traceable to national laboratory. This is very common. TRL is another technique through reflect line. 
and LRM, line reflect match, typically is on probe stations, where you want to set the reference plane at a probe tip and come down to a PCB and make a measurement. And of course, de-embedding, we can measure the test fixtures, we can calculate test fixture by using 3D, 3D full wave solvers, or by approximation, we can do a port extension. There's an easy way we're going to talk about today also, we're going to discuss a bit about automatic fixture removal. So this is uh, the trending way of removing error in the lab. So Heidi showed this graphic of USB type C, so I won't go into too much detail, but it's a very handy connector that I think will become very popular. And there's history of many different form factors, but you can be guaranteed for high-speed commercial devices that always will become faster, smaller, and cheaper. This is the trend of everything that, that we must design. So how do we test the physical layer? USB Type-C or these other interconnect that I mentioned? Well, the time domain reflectometer is just a wide band equivalent time sampling oscilloscope that will of course measure in the time domain. It's got a very wide band receiver on the input. The vector network analyzer is a narrow band instrument that will sweep a sine wave and will track that sine wave swept in this case, the VNA is a pixie chassis. So this is kind of a nice form factor where you have modules that slip in and out, and one module that's vertical is a complete two-port vector network analyzer. So this is very scalable. You can have a four-port system for your R&D department, then if you want to transition to manufacturing, you can go up to 32 ports if you like. Okay, so for our design case study today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put together two fixtures that normally in the real world, uh, end user will probably just use one. But since we have the capability to do some interesting de-embedding, we're gonna put the two fixtures together and try and get the model of that USB Type-C connector. So on the left-hand side, we have the receptacle PCB which is normally where the host resides. On the right-hand side, we have the plug PCB, where normally the USB cable would reside. And so, in the real world, you would have two case studies or two use case models. On the left, you would have a cable manufacturer who would use the receptacle PCB and hook up to the test equipment that way. Or, on the other use case model, the manufacturer would be a device manufacturer, a PC, uh, a laptop, or a hard drive, or something like that, and they would test it using the plug PCB. So our, our challenge is going to be cascading the models, and what we want to obtain is just that Type-C mated connector. So we could do the cascading of the model of the full channel that we were discussing. Uh, what we can easily measure, of course, is the two of them plug together, because they naturally have a plug and a receptacle that mate to one another. And you can notice, in here, we have some interesting looking blue tape. Does anyone know what the blue tape is for? It stops the cables from moving around. So this is a bit of a trick in the lab. You know, when you have very high dynamic range where any type of flexing of a cable will introduce a phase error, what you want to do is minimize the movement of the cables. And so we've found quite repeatedly that if you can minimize the position of the cables and stop them from moving, in fact, the best way is to calibrate with these cables already laid out in a certain pattern, and then carefully insert the fixtures or the device under test. So these are just little tricks in the lab that you pick up after time. So we mentioned the types of 
VNA calibration that can be done. This is an example of many of these TRL calibration boards. Now, let me just mention that TRL has been a microwave calibration technique for many decades. It's the, the typically the most flexible calibration to set the reference plane wherever the microwave engineer would like to inside of his microwave module. The high-speed digital industry has adopted this and they can now build PCB-based TRL calibration kits. In order to build this calibration kit, you need five standards minimum, a through, a reflect, line one, line two, and line three. Each line is for a different frequency range. Now, of course, this is a challenging thing to do on an FR4-based dielectric PCB, but it can be done, and it has been done, and these are examples of that. So, using this traditional TRL technique, what we would normally do is we would apply a rule of thumb, and the rule of thumb is find a controlled impedance environment using TRL from the right side. So from the plug PCB, we'd like to find where there's a nice 50 ohm uh, impedance. Most reference planes don't like to be at an area where there's a big reflection, where there's a lot of excess inductance or a lot of excess capacitance. This is not a good stable area for a reference plane. So normally what we do is we back off a little bit into the test PCB where you can have a nice transmission line. And so we can do that on both of these fixtures, on the, on the plug cable fixture and the host receptacle fixture. And so when you do that, it turns out in this case, you end up counting the connector itself twice. And this is not what we want. And so in order to do this, this plug and play, S parameter, you look at the time delay, the propagation delay of each of these separate components, the receptacle fixture and the plug fixture, and they should add up to just one path. And Heidi and I found that after we tried this with the traditional TRL method, it was counting the connector twice. And this is not, this is not what we want. And just to, to explain how that happens a little better, there's two tiers of calibration that have been done here. The first tier is the SOLT, which puts the reference plane, the first reference plane, at the end of the test cable, just at the input to that host PCB. Then the second tier calibration is this TRL, where you use that TRL calibration kit, and that moves the reference plane one more time to this area here. But as I mentioned, this doesn't work so well because you double count. So what we found was a better approach in this case is still a two-tier calibration, but we used SOLT than the automatic fixture removal. Now, the automatic fixture removal, how many people have heard of this before? Just a few. Um, this is, there's a number of papers we've written on this, so I'm not gonna go into a great detail, and I'll reference some papers for you. But briefly, what you can do is use um, an open circuit reflect measurement of a fixture and measure S11. And after you measure S11 of a test fixture that you want to de-embed, the AFR algorithm will extract S22, S12, and S21. And by the way, that's the behavioral model of the fixture itself, and therefore you can de-embed that fixture model. So this is the method that we wanted to try, and a side benefit of that is when you go from the receptacle PCB fixture to the receptacle itself, they're normally different dielectric materials. And so when you have them together, you have a non-homogeneous dielectric system. And normally to de-embed that sort of thing by building a model with a tool rather than a measurement is very difficult. 
And so in this case, it was a simple measurement. AFR was applied. It worked beautifully, so we were happy with this. So as I mentioned, there's two different ways to measure a linear passive interconnect. And in our case, we wanted to use the vector network analyzer. And we had a 20-port VNA setup, and we taped down the cables, as I mentioned, and just did a minimal amount of movement between the two. And so in the laboratory, these sort of tips and tricks will help you. Now, you're probably thinking a 20-port VNA measure will probably take me about an hour, and calibration will take me four hours. Um, things have changed quite a bit, and this is not the case. A full crossbar calibration for a 20-port system probably takes about 10, 11 minutes, and it's used with an electronic calibration module. You don't have to screw and unscrew all of the standards like that NIST traceable wooden box I showed earlier. There's a little electronic module that has the standards built in that will switch under program control. So why do we even care about a 20-port measurement? Why don't we just look at one differential channel at a time, which would be two ports in, two ports out, a four-port measurement, and you're done? Well, we wanted crosstalk. Near-end and far-end crosstalk is uh, one of the compliance specifications for USB 3.0. In fact, not only is there intra-pair crosstalk but there is the old legacy USB 2.0 channel in the same cable as the new high-speed 3.0 cable. So in one cable, there's a specification for crosstalk that must be met between high-speed and low-speed. So when you have a four-port VNA measurement, you have a four-by-four four matrix or 16 elements. When you have a 20-port measurement, you have 400 waveforms or elements within the matrix. So in this case, we're looking at just the first quadrant of 400 S parameters. And so one of the challenges is that you have to manage this data, and it actually is quite easy when you start using uh, tools that work with the vector network analyzer or the time domain reflectometer. And what we start doing now is what's called data mining. Yes, you have a question? Yeah. Um, you talked about earlier before on the non-homogeneous -homo uh, calibrations when using uh, tier one and tier two calibration. Yes. And then you talked about uh, this tool that the embed the, the structure. Yes. But if you, if this, uh, if you de-embed a structure that is uh, that doesn't have the same dielectric as the what that you uh, as the, um, the plane that you used for the first calibration, yes, is that isn't that the same problem? Are you are you are you talking about comparing tier one with tier two? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So tier one is just SOLT, mm -hmm. and that's using the standard VNA calibration with the short open load through. Okay, no de-embedding. This is pre-measurement error correction. Mm -hmm. TRL is post-measurement error correction. So there's two different types of error correction, and they're being done in totally different ways. But the idea is that you first shift the reference plane to a spot that's well known at the end of your test cable, and then you use the TRL for the next. Now, the AFR, the reason why this works is because from the first reference plane location to the second, we're measuring just S11. There's no topological model that's in the information from the measurement. It's just S parameters. Yeah, but those S parameters aren't measured on a certain structure that has uh, different uh, characteristics than the first calibration that doesn't, it, it doesn't matter because when you have an automatic fixture removal algorithm uh, and you end up measuring S11, we're, we're, um, we are assuming in the AFR that there's no radiation at the output of the open. So that is one limitation. 
And if it does radiate, then you will not get as accurate results and you have to try another method. This is maybe something I can talk to you offline if you don't mind, okay. before we take too much time. Because I do want to get through a demonstration after the slides. Another question? Did you use the four port e card for doing the first calibration? Did you use a four port e card for doing the first calibration? Yeah. I think there is a problem that if you're using the four port e card, so you have crosstalk because the ports are uh, near. And the e card with two ports is much better for doing a better calibration and reduce the cross between mm, the ports? Not, not really. There's, based on whatever frequency range that you need to use for your measurement, you can have either a two-port eCal or a four-port eCal. The two-port eCals go up to 67 gigahertz. There is very high isolation inside the eCals. So the crosstalk and directivity of the couplers inside the VNA are very precise and will remove all of the crosstalk down to more than minus 120 dB. So this is not a problem. Also in the four-port eCal? Four-port eCal is, is not quite as high, maybe, maybe 100, 110 dB, okay. but still very good for signal integrity applications. So I'm going to move on. Thank you for the good questions. So when we're in the lab, a step-by-step -step analysis I would say the first thing that we want to do with such a high port count of data is create a topology map. And so this is something that we can do. So if you have someone that either challenges your data or you're going to publish the data or maybe repeat the data measurement, you know which cables went where. And what, what's happening today is companies are building very large volumes and archives of multi-port S-parameter data. Just like modeling groups have libraries of models and they recall that for, for new projects perhaps that they can leverage existing work that's already been done, this is exactly the same case that's happening today in signal integrity labs around the world. People are making multi-port measurements and then saving that data in an archive. When you create the topology map, it's easy to retrieve the data, recall what it means, and explain this is what keeps the data useful. After you've made the measurement and you start looking at the information, we're starting to data mine. Just like on the internet, there's way too much information to look at everything. You just look at the important data. And in this case, the first thing I'd like to do is start in the time domain. It's very intuitive, impedance versus distance. It makes a lot more sense to me than S parameters in the beginning. And the first thing I do is look for symmetry. When you make these multi-port measurements, you have both forward TDR and reverse TDR all in that one huge touchstone file, that big 20 by 20 matrix. So you can immediately put all these plots onto all these waveforms onto one plot, and you can see actually in a way it's, it's a, a beautiful waveform, and you can right away see if there's an outlier. If there's something that's wrong with one channel, it'll just pop out at you. In this case, we have some reflections due to some of these PCB impedance discontinuities of the plug fixture and the, uh, the host fixture. We'll take a look at those in more detail, but in general, you can see that there's a lot of symmetry here. The next step is that identify key characteristics inside the channel. And we, we start to associate spatial location of the impedance discontinuity so we know where to go fix the reflections if there is a loss of, of energy due to reflection. So one of the things that I like to do first is overlay the open fixture measurement onto the full channel measurement. 
So here you can see I've tried to align the physical structure with the impedance waveform. And so you can take a look here. Right here we have a little capacitive discontinuity, which is these SMA connectors here. Then we have a short transmission line. It's a little bit of uh, non-uniformity, but this is on the PCB between the SMA and the USB receptacle. Then, if I make a separate measurement after I pulled them apart, then I'm going to get an open circuit that flies way up here. And there is indeed two waveforms over here, and then the one waveform here. And then you can continue on the rest of the channel. You can see inside here, there's another PCB inside this module, and then there's a long cable all the way here. So this is how we start associating the spatial continuity of the fixtures, which would be any interconnect channel you're, you're trying to characterize. I do the same thing in the reverse TDR. So it's very similar. OK. Um, step four, I normally start to look at the differential S parameters without trying to consider crosstalk. But the reason why this is so interesting is, of course, there's four by four matrix is one differential channel. So this quadrant number one is differ in, differential out. This is the real world signal functioning. So this is where we normally start the analysis for S parameters. And right here, is this a reflection or a transmission term? SDD11 is a reflection term, right? So this is differential return loss. Right here, SDD21, this is a through measurement. So that's differential insertion loss. This fourth quadrant is common in, common out. Not so popular for analysis, but for me, quadrants two and quadrants three are the most interesting. We call these mixed mode S parameters. Now, mixed mode S parameters, this will tell us whether a particular structure in a channel is susceptible to EMI or if it's going to be emitting EMI. And one of the models that we can use to think about understanding what's going on inside the channel is take a perfect differential pair. You have one leg and a second leg, and they're perfectly symmetric. And so if you have any incident radiation on this perfectly symmetric pair, what should happen? You should have no effect. There should be good common mode rejection ratio, and it shouldn't matter whatever incident radiation is on. However, let's say that during the manufacturing process or something during the design, one leg of the differential pair has some anomaly, either a gouge out of the PCB trace where copper's been removed, or even maybe a piece of solder has fallen onto it and added excess capacitance. Well, now we don't have that good symmetry that we did before. So when that incident radiation is now upon that asymmetric differential channel, that common energy can be converted into differential energy and ride along with the data. So at the receiver, there's a small delta voltage that is due only to that incident radiation. So this is EMI susceptibility. So this is something that's very useful to look at in the frequency domain. It's also extremely useful to look at this mode conversion in the time domain. Why would, it, why would it be so useful, you think, to look at mode conversion in the time domain? Think of the TDR impedance profile waveforms that we've been looking at. You can see the structures in the channel that are offending and creating mode conversion. So, so this is a very useful thing. Not only can you find out at what frequencies in the frequency domain, but now you can compare it and put it on the same time domain reflection waveform and say, oh yeah, that's that PCB inside the plug fixture and know exactly where to go fix it. So S parameters, they're the basis for all of the other domains of analysis, which is something I'm gonna show you very quickly here. 
Um, this was just a quick slide to review the TRL. If someone wasn't perfectly clear on that concept, remember I mentioned you have to build five structures, the through, line one, line two, line three, and the open. Building five structures is a lot more work than building one structure or just using the fixture itself. So automatic fixture removal has pretty much replaced TRL in 90% of the labs around the world. So it's, it's probably being used for 500 different labs. And the reason is very obvious. It's much more simple to use one structure and it's proven to be just as accurate. So why not save the time? Um, quick question. Yeah, this tool has also the capability of measuring the short, right? yes. not just the open. What is the difference if I add this component as well? Good question. So the question is, with the AFR, I mentioned you can measure the open and look at S11, and then it'll extract S22 and the other terms. You can also use a short. Either open or short is a reflect, and that'll be something that can be used by the algorithm to determine the amount of loss and the propagation delay. The short has the added advantage of controlled EMI fields at the end of that fixture. If it's open and it radiates excessively, then you try the short. If you want to, you can add them both together and that just gives you another data point to make it a little more accurate. Good question. And then one last review slide. I mentioned the overall umbrella term is error correction, and the pre-measurement terms or pre-measurement methods are in the blue circles. The post-measurement error correction are the red triangles. And this is just a model that I created to give you a relative idea, just a, a qualitative idea of all these different types of error correction. And if you notice, if you plot how accurate they are with how much work they are or how complex, it's fairly linear with most of them, except automatic fixture removal has really changed the game, so to speak, because it's just as accurate as TRL, but it's much easier. So many people don't use all of these methods, but they are available to you in the lab if you choose to do a comparison. Okay, getting back to the steps of analysis, one of the last things here that I usually typically do is I have the S parameter data, I'm analyzing frequency domain, time domain, I can actually look at I diagrams and then I can build pass fail criteria for each of the parameters. So I can build a test template. So this actually is something that's been um, it's been created from the standard of USB type C and there are some very specific pass fail levels for both time domain and frequency domain parameters and so when you have the S parameter you can extract all the different domains and analyze pass or fail in just one operation so it's actually very useful you don't need to have five different instruments so you can really save a lot of money when you start building up a laboratory if you get the right tools to start with. Okay. Um, can I do a quick time check just to see how much time I've got? Perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through the TDR analysis to make sure I have time for the demo. Um, basically, these were a little bit of tricks and tips that we found while we were doing the analysis. Um, and of course, the time domain was the most useful. Here is the, uh, the full channel again with multiple channels overlaid. And you can start to see some of these anomalies that pop out, okay? And looking at all of the differential insertion loss, you can tell they're all very similar all these differential return loss measurements are all very similar and so nothing jumps out immediately so so far so good but then we found inside the plug cable fixture there was one line that had 
uh, a bit of a capacitive load in the middle of it, and th that seemed to be an outlier. It was the only channel that had that, and so we looked at it, compared the impedance profile to the structure itself, and you can go from differential impedance profile to single-ended impedance profile, and in that case, we found that there was two lines that were actually pinched. Somehow they had got bent or kinked or, or stepped on, you don't really know. But this was a validation that one of the outliers indeed was a real issue. In a similar way, we looked at the impedance profile on the, um, on the host PCB and we noticed that there were some anomalies here that were quite different for the positive and negative for one differential channel. And when we looked at the uh, SMA connectors, it was obvious someone had resoldered a connector on. So I don't know how much lab time you guys spend, but I've spent a lot and I've broken a lot of connectors off PCBs. It happens, you repair them, you do the best you can. But knowing what's causing things is just a reassurance that you're characterizing very well. We also had some mated connectors that we looked at through here. And if you combine the damage with the line and the connector, you can see the insertion loss was much higher on one of these channels. And it was at a higher frequency, around 20 gigahertz. And so that was something we found. Interestingly, we found a little inductive kick right where we thought the plug and receptacle were mated. And remember, this is kind of the area where it's not a good place for the reference plane. It's not a well-controlled impedance environment. And so we were kind of curious what was going on there. And so we looked at it in a little more detail, and it turns out we found that inside the plug cable fixture, there was a PC board. So we opened up the shell and we found that there was a differential pair, but one leg of the pair looked much different than the other leg of the pair. And so this is exactly the situation that I described earlier, where if you have a differential pair that's asymmetric and you have any incident radiation, that your common mode rejection ratio won't be very good and this shows up in the impedance profile. And so we had no idea because it was in a shell, covered up, screwed on, and it turns out the PCB layout tool did this automatically because it thought the propagation delay was more important. And so these are some of the things that, you know, skew can be corrected by a PCB layout tool, but you will see the effects of this, and sometimes it won't be so great, when you finally look and measure your prototype. So these are things just to kind of be aware of when you're in the lab making measurements. And I think the last little tip and trick here that we found was uh, we had the uh, receive and transmit lines that were a little bit uh, different impedance. And we actually went back to the designer and asked him why we found the difference here because it was actually uh, fairly significant and one channel was different than the other, it turns out they were on different layers. So they were routed on different layers um, on the same board and that made a difference if it's micro strip or strip line. So, so these are just little things that if we can save you an hour or two in the lab, then we try and do that for you. So um, in conclusion of the slides, um, I would say, especially for USB 3.0, but for any type of interconnect, uh, define your reference planes carefully, uh, document your measurement, and do these topology maps so you can revisit the data later, and you don't have to redo it, but you understand what port was connected to what. Do your sanity checks. Do something where you anticipate the right answer and then look for the right answer. And if you guessed right, then you can confirm. If you guessed wrong, then you can say, well, I need to relook at something else. 
always try and use the time domain to identify these key channel features. Um, and when you, don't, when you get something you don't expect, take a look at it. And uh, extracting fixture models is something that can be done very simply now with some of the new tools. Um, before I start the demo, what I'd like to do is, first of all, say thank you uh, for all uh, attending. And I've arranged for um, a free download copy of my book that I published with Eric Bogatin. Uh, if you go to our website there, it asks for your contact information, and you can download the, the new second edition that we just finished with some new material. And the only thing, it was normally set up for continental US, so when it asks one, what country, just say USA. I've got the approval from Keysight, so it's okay to do that. So this could be something that would be helpful for you uh, if you're doing a lot of high-speed digital signal integrity analysis. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is I would like to show you how we can look at USB 3.0 S parameter data. So this was a measurement that we made um, a few months ago. And when I have my four port S parameter measurement of that USB channel with the two fixtures that we've been looking at, I can view this many different ways. Again, I like to start in the time domain just because that's where I feel the most comfortable. And because it's a, a, a four port measurement, we have a four by four matrix. And the first one that I like to look at here is the TDD11. So this is simply the SDD11, the differential return loss, except now we've done an inverse fast Fourier transform. IFFT, and what do we get when we do a fast invest, inverse fast Fourier transform on differential return loss? We get the impedance profile, okay? So there's a one-to-one -one mapping. And so what we can do immediately is we can change the vertical units from millivolts into ohms and auto scale, and now we can see with the marker, we can read this just as if it were from a TDR scope, but it's from the original calibrated high dynamic range vector network analyzer measurement after we've done a lot of the air correction. And so here you can read the, the impedance of that cable, 105 ohms. You can see the excess capacitance, some excess inductance. And of course, this TDD21 is a transmission measurement. And this will be time domain transmission. What do we learn from this? Well, we know if the rise time degrades from the input of the channel to the output of the channel, and we know if the amplitude decreases, which typically it will for FR4, and we can look at propagation delay. Then, of course, we can go to our frequency domain, and this is the native data that was gathered with the VNA. And so here is that differential return loss that we spoke about. Here is the differential insertion loss. And many times people will ask, well, what, what's the bandwidth of that fixture? Uh, and that's kind of a rule of thumb that digital guys will use. And the easy way to do that is to drop a marker and take it to the 3 dB point. And it's got about a 9 gigahertz half power bandwidth. This will give you a rough idea of, of what the bandwidth of that fixture is. We can also do eye diagrams. And in this case, it's a very quick eye diagram synthesis. So now you're, you should think, well, wait a minute. How do I get an eye diagram with just S parameters? Don't you need a, a PRBS data source and put that through the channel and then look at it with the scope? Well, it turns out of course, that's one way to do it. We've done it that way for decades. This way, we do a synthesized eye diagram where it's, it's not a simulated eye. Simulated eye is, a, is what we term if you're using a modeling tool that you don't maybe know where the model came from or to what frequency the model is accurate up to. With a synthesized eye, 
It's a S parameter measurement that's been calibrated and you get that S parameter of the channel and then you can do an impulse response extraction from that S parameter, then a convolution of that impulse response with a virtual pattern generator. And you get a big data train and then you overlie each bit period and you get an eye diagram. So this is actually the same algorithm that would be inside ADS, the 86100 oscilloscope, and then this is the physical air test system software. So all of those three instruments are developed and designed and worked on in Santa Rosa in our headquarters. And so we're just in two buildings away that we work together on this stuff to make sure that the answers correlate with different tools. So, and then of course, when I mentioned that you can build these test templates like we did for the USB 3.0, you can start putting your own margin in. You may have a standard that you have to meet in the final test, but you might have a certain yield where you want your pretest to have a little more margin. And so you can decide how much margin you want on any of these, and you can input your own mask, or you can import a mask from a standard. And then likewise, any insertion loss, you can build a limit line impedance profile, you can put plus and minus limit lines, and then if you're in, so this would be mostly manufacturing, to, uh, excuse me, an R&D tool, but if you're in manufacturing, you can do a very quick test, which would be this template idea, and it actually is, once you build it, it's this fast. So instead of choosing the domain, you just choose the test template. And it will calculate the parameters here. So, so this was based on the pass-fail for USB 3.0. And you can see the impedance profile here, near-end crosstalk in the time domain, insertion loss, near-end crosstalk in the frequency domain. Here is that one parameter that I mentioned. It's the crosstalk between the legacy USB 2.0 and the new high-speed USB 3.0. And then, of course, PAM4 can be applied just as well as NRZ eye diagrams. So with that, that is um, the demo that I wanted to show you uh, as a general overview. And so, uh, at this point, I'd like to say thank you for your time. Uh, Todah. <laughs>